Hello, everybody. So I'm Cyprian Todorov. So today I'll uh, try to present you, uh, let's say, a new design pattern for the DSL program monitoring. So the overview of my speech, I'll present a little a bit the context, the problem that we are trying to address, our contribution, and I'll conclude and give some perspective. So basically, if we are in a system engineering process for, let's say, uh, critical systems. We'll start the development our we, of our system with the requirements. From these requirements, we, the industry today uses some formal general uh, uh, programming languages. Uh, we extract some properties that we want to verify, to debug, or to, to, to check. And in between the two, we have a high-level toolbox that uh, it's aimed at uh, di diagnostic, uh, diagnosticking problems on the formal uh, generic pro purpose language. And we have a generative process which will generate low, like low-level executable code in C, for instance, which can be, again, debugged and uh, profiled and whatever. In this situation, we have two problems. First of all, we have an accidental uh, complexity in between the level, the high level of the requirements, and the implementation language, uh, which is a general purpose language. And we have a semantic gap in between the high level and the low level execution code. We can address a part of this problem by introducing, by using DSLs, like uh, for instance, state chart, let's say. But in this case, with a typical uh, simple DSA that we start to, to, to write in our garage, we'll have the problem that we have this, uh, this whole missing toolbox problem. One possible solution to address this problem will be to introduce a transformation from this DSL to a formal DSL which has a connection with these tools, for which these tools are available. While this problem, sol uh, this solution solves the problem of the the disconnect between the requirements, the, the gap between the requirements and the uh, general pro 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 programming language. There is an equivalence problem in between the executable code and the formal DSA. Now we have to prove that the code that we're executing is equivalent to the code on which we, uh, which was diagnostic, the wha uh, where our diagnostic was applied. So, so basically, we have, from my perspective, we have a much bigger problem in this situation. Another way to, to, to deal with this problem was just to say, OK, we have a DSL. That will make executable using a given technique. And we want to create a link between our DSL and the diagnosis toolbox. And OK, this thing is not new. We have a bunch of language org benches today. And I'd like to, uh, to cite uh, GMOC, which has a very nice diagnostic toolbox for debugging, for uh, simulation, and other things. We have Spoofax, we have APS, we, can, we have K framework, which tries to have like a formally defined approach for defining DSLs. But the, the end, on the other hand, we have some domain-specific diagnostic tools that are very, very performant. We have like a nice, where at least when you read about these tools, they seem to be very performant and very well adapted to debugging DSLs. When you read about multiple debugging, it seems nice. DS profile for profiling, MetaSpy equally for profiling, and uh, there is this LTS mean for model checking that it's uh, DSL specific, uh, language independent model checking. So basically, what we are trying to achieve is how can we connect the language or benches that we have with these existing tools. Because why we are trying to connect these uh, workbenches with the existing tools? Because there is a certain effort involved in developing these kinds of, of tools. And on this side, there is a lot of effort involved in developing these tools. So why bother the language designers, uh, the language workbench designers, with the implementation of these kind of tools when maybe we can do just a connection in between. <coughs> so in order to, to precisely define, to define a little bit more precise this connection, which we extracted like 10 requirements. And uh, we defined the DSL monitoring as a process of observing the execution of a program expressed in the DSL, which is not 
magic. It's, we can find this, uh, this definition in the literature. And the requirement, the first requirement is the completeness. We, we need to be able to observe everything that has a meaning in, the, uh, in our DSL. It, it, the, uh, ideally, the, the diagnostic tool should not interfere with the execution of our DSL. We should be generic enough in order to be able to develop specific diagnostic tools for our purposes. We should uh, ensure a certain uh, uh, good level of uh, composability. So basically, that we can manage to monitor the monitors. So basically, uh, we have a debugger and a profiler, and maybe we can use a conditional debug or conditional breakpoint on the uh, profiling result, for instance. Um, in some situations, we might want to support an anti anti anticipated monitoring. That, mea that means, basically, I have deployed my system, and uh, there is a problem that I want to, to connect my debugging tools, my diagnostic tools, on an existing uh, program that uh, it's executing. Our solution should be portable enough, because the language workbenches are implemented in different languages, the tools for diagnostics in different uh, languages. So basically, there we have to have like very little constraints on the, on the portability. Uh, we, should, uh, we shall enable easy integration with the DSL runtimes, ideally without touching the, DSL, the existing DSL runtimes. And the same thing for the, for the tool side, since the tool developer, like the debugger developer, spent like years to develop his debugging de debugger. It won't be nice to, for uh, from us to ask him, like, yeah, you can start from scratch because in our situation you have to do it like that. Uh, for the user, in this case, we should be able to minimize the gap in between the the language that we are diagnosticking and the tool, the language that you are using, we are using for diagnostics. And uh, sometimes during the diagnostic, it is nice to, to be able to break the rules. So for instance, to, to change a variable during a debug session to see what happens next. Even though in a deploy system, you might not, be a, uh, might not, you might not want to do that. Uh, so those are the requirements. Uh, there are lots of works in this, uh, in this domain, there are lots of approaches, and we, we choose to, to, to start from uh, uh, Kisson's Monitoring Semantics, which is a, a nice paper presented at PLDI in 91. So basically the idea is the following. In order to interpret a language, you will traverse the, the abstract syntax tree in a certain order, and to make it simple, in the monitoring semantics presented by Kisson, basically they add two operations. Uh, you annotate your, your AST, and you have like a pre-processing uh, operation and a post-processing operation. The pre-processing operation happens before the evaluation of the node that you have annotated, and the post-processing evaluation happens after. This way, it can observe the results obtained by the evaluation. So they have very nicely defined that in a, in a formal settings, and uh, I can resume it in, a, let's say, this highly abstract equation. We have a, specific, a specification of an interpreter that to this specification, w we add the specification of a monitor, and at the end, we'll get a monitoring interpreter. With this equation, there are some quirks. The interpreter should be specified in a continuation spacing style, the monitor uh, basically are, to, are to is defined by two functions. It's specified with two functions uh, that takes the argument, the annotation, the syntactic terms, the semantic domain of the language, and uh, the monitoring state at the moment of the call. And it will return a new monitoring state after executing this function. And the post-processing uh, post function is similar with the exception that the resulting value from the evaluation of the operation of the previous operation, uh, it's passed as, a, uh, as an argument. And uh, yeah, the nice thing is that is defined in the, in the monitoring semantics of Kisson is the combination operator that is used here to, to compose the interpreter with the monitoring semantics. 
And if now we're trying to, to look at the requirements that we have listed, and uh, yeah, the, uh, this, uh, this solution achieves completeness because we'll be able to observe all the, the effects of application of all uh, semantic rules on each node of the IST, so on each sy syntactic term. Uh, in, the, in their similar paper, the authors prove the non-interference of this monitoring scheme on the, with respect to the execution of the language. Uh, the approach is generic because basically we can define our own monitoring functions and we will be able to define all kinds of uh, strange uh, diagnostic tools. It's composable and uh, this is uh, very, is very nice uh, with respect to much of our diagnostic tools in, uh, uh, in, use, uh, in use today. However, it does not support an anticipated monitoring because of the composition operator will have to, to have started the execution of the application with the monitoring interpreter. And basically, we have to change the interpreter duri during execution, which can be tricky. So for that ma for that's why we are saying that it does not really support an anticipated monitoring. The portability is not really good it's in, in the sense that it's uh, described in a uh, highly sophisticated language uh, with uh, like very formal and uh, except some works in uh, like Haskell and some functional uh, language by some functional language guy in like uh, object oriented uh, uh, style it's hard to, to port the thing and basically we did the exercise and we found out that it's hard and this is one of the motivations why we are trying to present the, the, the our results on this. Uh, the, the integration with the DSL runtime supposes that you are able to express your, your semantics in a continuation passing style, which might need imply that you have to rewrite your, your existing interpreter. I, on the tool integration side, basically, uh, yeah, you will have to be able to define these functions. Probably this, this is supported as much as in our case, so basically maybe this is wrong, uh, the red there, but yeah. Uh, the minimization of the gap was not addressed and will not address it either, because basically this implies a, a communication in between the guy that is developing the tool and the guy that's developing the, the language. So basically we are trying to, uh, to abstract ourselves from that and work on the interface, helping them communicate, but not achieving that communication by ourselves. And basically, since they have proved that uh, there is no way to interfere in the with the execution of the language, uh, they cannot break the rules of the language. So, yeah. Uh, so, in the following, we'll present our contribution, which is, let's say, an incarnation of the monitoring semantics in the object-oriented style, with some extensions. So basically, what we assume in, uh, in our case is that we have a visitor or an interpreter pattern which is used to, uh, to implement our, uh, our language runtime, our interpreter, our semantics. Uh, in the following, we're uh, basically focus on the discussion on the use of the visitor pattern because personally, I like it very much because mainly it isolates the semantics from the syntax much as in the formal case. And it pre prevents a mix between the AST data and the evaluator state that will be intertwined with, uh, with each syntactic term in, uh, in the case of using the interpreter pattern. Uh, so basically, through the usage of these two very common uh, implementation patterns, we are saying that, in our case, there is no need to change existing implementations of uh, evaluators. And... Um, yeah, and basically uh, here we present just uh, the typical uh, incarnation of uh, interpreter using uh, visitor pattern. So basically we have the element uh, which accepts a visitor, a visitor interface, and then the ev evaluator implements that interface. And uh, yes, in our case, we have isolated uh, the semantic domains, in a, in encapsulated them in a specific ev evaluator state uh, item. So basically, we have this separation. For the for the monitor, uh, we found that uh, in the in the initial paper of the Kison, there was a disconnect in between the syntax and the and the semantics. Basically, they were independent, 
There was no link in between, which, uh, which would pose problems uh, basically for the guys developing tools because in that case, maybe the, the syntax of a specific monitoring tool will clash with the syntax of another specific monitoring tools. So in order to solve that problem, we have introduced a concept, a monitor link, we called it, which basically just links the syntax with the semantics. So in that this way, we, we focus the evaluation of our monitor on the syntax which was prescribed for it, instead of evaluating any syntax on which we are which we are finding throughout our traversal. So through, through this approach, we obtain generici genericity, much like in the case of the Kison mo uh, monitoring semantics. And we have independent, uh, we enable independent monitor development because of, con because of co this connection in between the syntax and the semantics of the our diagnostic tools. And uh, <coughs> yes, the monitoring semantics is dependent of the semantics of the language which which we are monitoring, and uh, this uh, dependence is it's, uh, made explicit through the usage of the evaluator state and the value, which is the basically the same as in the case of the formal framework. Uh, so now we come to the composition operator, uh, like the plus that was on the high-level formula. The composition operator basically is just uh, defining like a, a generic syntax for uh, for annotating our AST. In this case, we, we choose to use the deco decorator uh, pattern because this is, uh, this is nice. Uh, for example, in the case of an anticipated monitoring, we'll be able to just inject a new node. We, we, are, we don't have, for, for instance, to, to touch an existing language in order to, uh, to add an annotation field in the top level class of the uh, AST hierarchy. Through, through the decorator, basically, we'll just inherit from the elements that we might want to, uh, to, to annotate, and that's it. Uh, we have a decorated visitor, which basically inherits from the visitor interface in the of our language, and a monitoring evaluator, which inherits from the initial evaluator. So basically, in terms of the requirements, uh, requirement one, the completeness, it's as much achieved as in the case of uh, Kison monitoring semantics through the use of the decorator. Through the use in the of inheritance, we don't need reflection, so basically we, uh, we argue that it's uh, more portable uh, that uh, other, uh, in other situations. Uh, and we don't impose modification to legacy code. And the requirement to, to the connection to the tools is basically realized through a link to the implementation of the syntax and semantics of the, the, the specific tool. Uh, in order to achieve composable monitor, we can just simply use the composite design pattern. There are some de uh, details on which I won't discuss now, but basically is this with a little bit of uh, magic, let's say. For unanticipated monitoring, we can just uh, try to, uh, we can just push the, the visit method from the monitoring visitor and implement it in the accept method of the decorator. In this way, the, the, the decorator itself intercepts basically the evaluation, uh, the, the, the dispatch to the monitor without the need of using a, a NAD of another uh, evaluator. So basically, we can just connect it to a running system through this uh, new uh, uh, syntactic term like annotation, which dispatches the evaluation to the, to the monitor. The drawbacks of this is that the code is less homogeneous because basically here we are like using a strange combination of interpreter and uh, visitor pattern and uh, this, this thing might interfere with other visitors using the accept method. But we can have like accept for evaluation and uh, that will solve that problem. Um, for non-interference and breaking the rules, basically there is a trade-off needed. These guys will fight. <laughs> so the idea is to expose a facade on the evaluator state to the monitor. So uh, through this facade, if the interpreter accepts modifications to its state, then we can do it. If it does not, it so basically this is something like a capability model for, uh, for handling this problem. Um, we have uh, showed in the paper, and I won't have time to present in details, uh, the, an illustration on the simple lambda calculus. Uh, for which we have generated automatically the, the, the annotations and the, the combination layer. 
Uh, here you have the like a simple tracer. So basically the trace syntax, which is uh, basically a trace point which contains a function uh, identifier and a list of argument identifiers. Uh, the tracer state, basically it's a string with its operations. I will spare you with that. And the tracer pre and post functions. Uh, the maybe the uh, most interesting thing is the call to the eval uh, to the lookup function of the interpreter uh, to to find out what is the value of uh, of an argument during a function call. Um, the user scenario for this case, I won't dive into details. Uh, we were able to integrate with an external uh, tool, uh, DS Profile, which is a uh, profiler implemented in Scala and that we used as a black box with minimum uh, requirements for integration. Basically, uh, these are the two functions, like uh, two un uh, one line of code here and two lines of code here. It's pretty good. And we get like decent profiling results. Okay. So in terms of uh, the requirements, this is the, the coverage at the end. Of course, there might be some discussions on each point and yeah, there are there are lots of things that we are not addressing, but the the main ideas are there, right? Uh, from at least from our perspective. And in uh, in conclusion, we have presented this monitoring pattern. Why a pattern? Because we believe in knowledge transfer. We can, from our perspective, easily easily transform this pattern to a framework in the future. And but th that will be an incarnation of the pattern in a given language, and they will not help to to bridge the gap in between the tools and the tools. Uh, we have some improvements on the initial uh, work. We have illustrated this thing. And uh, of course, there is a need that might be easy to implement, but there is a need for IST decoration, like easily do IST decoration in order to, to interfere with, uh, with the, 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 the IST of the program. And what is not so easy is like what happens if we have a language with time semantics and how can we guarantee the non-interference in the presence of time? And uh, I, we are not sure if thi this will scale well in the case of distributed or like concurrent uh, uh, languages with a huge number of threads and there might be some uh, tweaks needed in order to, to achieve that. So that was my presentation. If you have any questions. I'm here for you.